Everybody thinks that functional training is a, a series of circus acts. Everybody wants to put somebody on a rocker board and throw them a ball. They want to put them on a standing platform and get them to do dumbbells, all right? That's not functional training. Functional training is training that allows you to do your function better, like pick up kids. If I teach you how to uh, balance on a tightrope, you got a great skill of balance, but how does that transfer to soccer? How does that transfer to baseball? How does that transfer to daily activities at home? So this is a concept that we have to work on so we don't um, misrepresent what functional training is. So what we want to do is go over the four pillars that we already went over, okay? Locomotion, level changes, push-pull, and rotation. I'll show you some of the basic stuff that I use to work each pillar. Now, some of the exercises are gonna be pillar one and three combined. They're gonna be one, three, and four combined. So, let's say, for example, that I go like this. Reaching lunge, and you guys that are in the fit class with, with Cliff, you've already done this stuff. Now, all we wanna do is cover why you're doing it. So, if you're going lateral reaching lunge, boom, and press, I've got a locomotive movement, which is a natural lateral step, I've got a level change, I've got a pull, I've got a push. So I got, look, locomotion, level change with rotation. This would be a level change without rotation, but what am I doing? As soon as I reach to one of my feet, I'm crossing the main line of the body. As soon as I cross the main line out of the body, I've got internal rotation to that hip, I'm in the transverse plane. So that's one of the reasons why everybody here does the lateral reaching lunge to press because it is all four pillars at the same time, okay? You can work combination movements like that in succession, which means you might do this five times, then you might do this five times, you might do this five times, and you might do this five times. That's working in succession. We love the sequencing or the combination, which means you're doing them all, one, you're, you're tying one movement after another, and a lot of times you're doing two movements at the same time. So if you're doing a level change and a pull, you got a combination movement. If you're doing level change, pull, push, you have a combination with a sequence. You see what I'm saying? So you don't have to learn the succession versus the sequence and how that'll come with time, but understand that at least there's a sequencing combination and a succession method that allows you to do things a little bit differently. That's a way you can take up the same exercise and dress it up and give it three different looks. So you can take the same thing, do it in succession, looks one way. Do the same thing, do it in combination, looks another way. Do the same thing and do it in sequence and it looks another way. So it just gives you a lot more weaponry to work with your clients, okay? A lot more diversity. So what's the first pillar? Locomotion. What are the two key features of locomotion? You better know this because it's part of the exam. What is the most blaring characteristic of locomotion? Single leg. All right, you walk, you run on a single leg at a time. Okay, single leg. Boom, boom. If you can't balance on this single leg and the hip collapses in all three planes of motion, flexes in the sagittal plane, laterally flexes in the frontal plane, and collapses triplanarly in the transverse plane, then you're gonna have a bad hip. You're gonna have an unstable hip. If that happens, it signals the senior population and says, hey, don't go weight bearing on one foot. And their gait looks like this. They're shuffling because they don't wanna leave one foot on the floor at a time, okay? So if you wanna improve human locomotion, single leg balance, single leg stability, is a must, that's the first thing you do even if it's an elite athlete, all right? So everybody, what's our favorite locomotion exercise from the standing position outside of balance on a single leg? Anterior reach. Everybody knows that, right? All right, so right now, give me two or three anterior reaches. Even if you're holding your pad, you don't have to just hold your pad and just give me this. Okay, just to get the hips going. Okay, if I go contralateral, which arm am I reaching with? Opposite, if I go ipsilateral, great. Now, which one gives me more internal rotation at the hip? The contralateral arm reach or the ipsilateral arm reach? Now look at my hip, look at this hip, there you go. 
If I, if I go ipsilateral, look at what happens. See? If I reach, my shoulder goes, and I turn, external rotation. Contralateral, even in a straight line, I already have to rotate. And if you have a doubt, look at how the shirts wrinkle. Okay? And it'll tell you real quick. Now, if I want more internal rotation, as in locomotion, slam on the brakes and go. Where do I go with my contralateral? Medial or lateral? Go lateral, give me a couple laterals. So you throw that hip into huge internal rotation being driven by the hand, which drives the shoulder. Okay, just give me three on each side. And of course, if we want to externally rotate, we go ipsilateral. Got it? All right, so the anterior reaches, mandatory in the sagittal plane and laterally in the frontal plane. Got it? Okay. Now, after here and here, what's our next more advanced progression? On a single leg. We got balance, anterior reaching, of course, high to very low, and then, no, no, we're not even there yet. What's the next hardest progression? Squats. We got pistols, and we have this, counterbalance, right? We have three, actually. Here, if both feet mirror, uh, mirror, if both feet mirror each other, it is called a non-counterbalanced, okay? Give me three on each leg. And go as low as you can go, but keep the feet right next to each other. As low as you can go, but keep the feet right next to each other. Okay? Now, give me three, three per leg. Which one is that one? Balanced or non-counterbalanced? Non-counterbalanced. Mirror feet, non-counterbalanced. Now we're going to counterbalance. Drop the foot back and give me three. You got it? Now, which one, which one, and let's go another one. Let's go either the pistol or the block knee. Give me a couple, give me three. Pistol is the same thing as the block knee. The femur's up forward. Okay, it's a, it's a, it's a harder variation of a non-counterbalance, single leg squat. Okay, now tell me, of those two major variations, we have three, but there's two major, non-counterbalanced here or here, and counterbalanced, okay? Out of those two major variations, which one is more quad dominant? Balanced or non-counterbalanced? Non-counterbalanced, why? Center of gravity, no. Because I can move your center of gravity with a medicine ball and it still happens the same way. Yes, but that causes, the leg up causes something that, there you go. No, you rotate the hips backwards. Remember, the hips are a bucket. Where is the water pouring? Okay? As soon as you go like this, look at what happens. Boom, my hip goes posterior, tilted posterior. And it's always very confusing because I always think, of the bottom of the hip. Which way is the bottom of the hip pointing? It's the opposite. Which way is the top of the hip pointing? That gives you the orientation. As soon as I go posterior tilt here by bringing my femur up, it takes my glutes out of it. As soon as I go counterbalance, look at what happens to the glutes. The pelvis, okay, the bucket pours the water forward. The pelvis anteriorly rotates. The ischial tuberosity comes up. Hamstring and glutes stretch. Bingo, they're ready to get fired. Okay, now. Based on what I just said, which one would you do to improve forward locomotion? Non-counterbalanced or counterbalanced? Counterbalanced Counterbalance all day long, twice on Sunday. You got it? So non-counterbalanced is this one. If you're tying your shoe, non-counterbalanced. If you're shooting in wrestling, non-counterbalanced. If you're coming off the blocks, non-counterbalanced. 
So that's why the non-counterbalance anterior reach and the non-counterbalance single leg squat is one of our favorite, favorite locomotive progressions here. You got it? Okay, now, now is where you start moving around the gym. We can add, we can add a balance component and we can add a locomotive component to everything, to everything we do, with dumbbells, with, it, with anything we want, by going on a single leg. And I want you guys to try a couple of different strategies so you can see how much and how much cool stuff is in the simple exercises. Okay, you'll, you'll say, wow, I never knew that there was that much in that little simple thing I was doing, but it's a lot of stuff. For example, one of my favorite ways to get good hips is to do things like curls and shoulder presses and upright rows with dumbbells. And everybody here at least has to try it either with real dumbbells, you know, you go out to a, wherever it is, you grab a medicine ball, whatever, just so you can see the difference. And trust me, you don't need heavy stuff. Remember, the locomotion phenomena is a number seven, not an A-frame. When you stand, it's the A-frame, like these walls. But when you're running, it is what? A seven. A seven. Got it? Now, when I'm in here and I've got dumbbells, it's balanced because I got 20 and 20, okay? But no, the fact that I'm moving this way, this way, this way, really gets this body going this way like this. And so you're challenging the seven doing this to it, right? Does everybody understand that? You're challenging the seven. The more you do it, the harder and more stable that seven becomes. That seven has to be stable so when you plant forces into the ground, the hip says, go ahead, daddy, and the brain gives your glutes and, and, and quads and everything more activation. If when you plant, this is mushy, the brain's gonna say it's not a stable joint and inhibit, neurally inhibit your lower body. What? Okay, now, all of these dumbbells, all of these band exercises that you do, okay, give transverse plane when the load is this way, which remember, when you plant, there's transverse plane loading. There's triplanar loading. So all the pulling and pushing on a single leg, you won't, you'll pull maybe with a pink band, maybe with a yellow, but you're gonna give your hips a lot of stability in all three planes. You're gonna give that seven multiplanar stability, okay? Now, if you want to advance the seven training of gait, do you go two hands? Do you go unilateral loading? Do you go ipsilateral? Contralateral, think about the answer. My questions to you on an exam would be, if I wanna load the seven maximally, do I go two hands, single hand, same side of the leg, or opposite side of the leg? Which one would provide the most amount of training for the seven, and the answer would be what? Contralateral arm loading. So you take here, boom. Boom, and you try to load laterally, bend the seven, bend the seven, bend the seven, and insist that your hips stay hard and laterally stabilized, and just bang. What is the difference between balance and stability training? And which one comes first? And this is extremely important for you to know why. Because if you don't know this, you don't know why you're doing stuff. And if you do know this, you'll be able to go to any gym, see a trainer doing something, and you'll know that they have absolutely no clue of what they're doing. And it's gonna be simple. And from, from today on, when I tell you, you're gonna be able to go to every gym and go, they don't know, and they don't know, and they don't know, and they don't know. And you'll see how many people don't know. And it has nothing to do with research. I'm gonna prove it to you all with common sense, with physics. What comes first, balance or stability? Stability, why? It's isometric? Not really. It's really not isometric because even like a, a, a person who balances on Cirque du Soleil, it balances on a ball, on a tightrope, whatever, there's movement. So stability or balance? Balance? Why? Okay. Uh, simple questions. Why? I think you can't be stable until you're balanced. Really? 
Is this, is this bar stable as it is just this whole bar? Could you bend it? It's pretty, pretty rigid, right? Okay, look, real simple. If the, if the floor was straight and this bar was actually flat at the bottom, right now, you know, it, it could, we could balance it, right? We could balance it. Is it stable, though? Okay. Is it stable? No? Can't move the bar. Is it balanced? No? It's balanced by definition. So you need stability before anything. Because you need to be able to stabilize your joints in such a position where your center of mass is directly above your base of support. And you can't do that unless you can stabilize the joints where you want them. So theoretically, balance is preceded by stability. If you don't have stability and control of your joints, you can't balance, period. Think of a pyramid on its base, balance on its, on its point. Which pyramid do you want to be? This pyramid is balanced by definition. Okay? By definition, a stable unit. Is this building stable? Yeah. Is it balanced? Yeah. Okay? Stability is the resistance against unwanted motion. Balance is manipulating opposing forces to create a stable state. So, why is this important? Because if the whole idea, the whole idea of balance, all right, is to get you back to stability. So if I'm here, I'm stable. But if my son comes and jumps on me real fast, I'm gone. So balance doesn't necessarily mean that you're really stable for functional movements unless your functional movement is walking on a tightrope. Why is this important? Because you shouldn't put anybody on a BOSU ball and throw them a medicine ball. What are you doing? They're balanced. When you're balanced like this, you can't apply a lot of forces. The whole idea of being able to be here is so you can be here as fast as possible. That's reaction time. The time that it takes you to go from balance to stability. And so your stable points are where you want to be. All right? Let me show you a demo, a real quick demo. Um, let me see. Some balance equipment. Hey, man, do me a favor. Uh, bring any one of those boards over there. As a matter of fact, Ann, throw me that big disc that you're in. Ann, throw me that, your, your bit. There you go. Perfect. All right. Now, over here. Awesome. All right. Do me a favor. Grab the 25s. Now, you tell me real quick, stand on here and curl. Exactly. You see his face? <laughs> All right. He went. Stand on here and curl. Yeah. Here, try to go like this and just see if you can balance. I want to see what you can do. And you'll see, it, I mean, it's common sense, right? Now, can you do anything? No. Try to curl, press them, do something. Can't do nothing, right? Now move to the side. Curl and press. With speed, man, not bodybuilding. Move them. Punch them a little bit, a couple of times. Bang, bang. All right, done. Done. Now, which individual do you want playing for you? The guy on here or the guy on here? How's he going to burn calories? Doing this or doing this where he can't? If I had an EMG on his stomach, what is it going to show me here? He can't even do the exercise. What's it going to show me here? A lot, of, a lot of signal. Who's burning more calories? The guy here trying to walk on a tightrope or this guy? Who's going to be better to carry my child if he jumps on him immediately? Who's going to be better to, to wrestle the opponent? This guy. So don't spend time on unbalanced equipment trying to generate high forces. Is balancing good? Is this stuff on a single leg good? Great, yes. You know when you do it? During your rest periods. Thank you, just put them down. Use balance during the rest periods. Why? Because we probably think it's good and it probably doesn't hurt you. But don't spend time trying to do strength training, strength training in an unstable environment. Do stability work and balance work in, a balance, in an unstable environment. So if you're standing on a BOSU ball, stand on it for 20 seconds in between chest presses. 
in between push-ups, in between stuff that really makes this stiff. Okay, I can balance on this, and if you touch my stomach, it's tone, you know, it's tone, but it's, you know, nothing crazy. But if I go here, and I pull a double, double black, or a green predator here, and you touch my stomach, I can't fake that. Okay, so when you're doing your single leg stuff, that's resting, it's resting for the legs. Do not substitute this for squats, good mornings, deadlifts, and leg presses. You understand what I'm saying? So mandatory, teach them to be pyramids. Get their feet on the ground, attach heavy stuff here, and yank them. That's stability training. The stability training you need, or the stability you need for balance, is low amplitude. Imagine the muscles are going, move a little bit more to the left. No, 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 a little bit more to the right. That's it, that's it. All right, move the other one. Versus my son coming, daddy, boom, 50 pounds, hauling at me about eight miles an hour. Or a guy trying to take me down. What are the muscles saying? Hold the spine, hold it, he's coming. You know, it's a scream versus a whisper. You got it? We got to train the screams. Cool? All right, now everybody, whoever wants to participate, get a couple of dumbbells, kettlebells, attach yourself to any cable, and give me a pull, a push, overhead, while on a single leg. Go. You got three minutes. Got three minutes. Just do a variety of movements. Pulling, pushing, overhead presses, curls, just on a single leg. Try double, try double hand, and then try single hand. Ipsy and contralateral. Just play around. You got about another two minutes. Two hands, two hands simultaneous, two hand alternating, and then go single arm. Grab anything. It doesn't matter, just so you can get the feel. Okay, you got another minute. Load the body one side. Okay, give me one arm, give me one arm, one arm stuff, so you can feel the difference. You'll see that the two-handed stuff is very easy compared to the one arm. Because as soon as I get you on a one arm, now I've got you rotating. It's like putting, taking one leg away from a table. The table wants to rotate and collapse. The contralateral is easier because of the serape effect. You got muscles that attach you from one hip to the opposite shoulder. So that's gonna be the most natural and that's gonna be the easiest. When you attach to that same side and you get rotated, it kind of feels weird. <laughs> Honey, you got man bands. But there's nothing. <laughs> <laughs> hey, 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 look, look, let me show you. See, watch. Go like this and you take this out. Boom. Here, just try this one, single arm. See? Yeah. All right. Okay? So we got locomotion out of the way. Let's start talking level changes. Okay? Level changes. The anterior reach and the single leg squat are already working on level changes, yes? Right? Okay? So even on that single leg balance, we were already starting on level changes. Two ways to change levels, basically. You either squat or you lunge. Or a combination. It's a staggered squat. It's an ugly lunge. All right? We're not going to go over the big squats anymore because we guys know it. One of the squats that I do want you to learn and I want you to use all of the time is the ABC squat. Why do we use the ABC squat? Come on, hips, hips, yes. If you see someone squatting, and at some point in time, the hips go to the right, the hips go to the left. Even the knees, one knee goes in, one knee goes out. And you want to say, all right, they're always going to one side. I want to drive the hips, okay, to the opposite side. A, B, C squats. It'll take them to the side that they don't want to go. All right, so right now, everybody give me three rounds of ABC squats.
When you reach with your hands, take your hips in the opposite direction. You have to. You're already doing it, but try to exaggerate it and try to teach your clients that. And what you're doing is you're driving the hip to where it doesn't want to go. You got it? All right. You can use medicine balls, of course. You can use dumbbells, a little plate, anything like that. Cool? Now, we're not going to talk about barbell squatting and, and all that stuff. What I want to do is talk about the reaching lunges. Because it is my favorite level change. Because you can change levels with the lower body, and you can change levels with the trunk, with the hips only. But when we change levels, it's normally that anterior reach look. It's the reaching lunge. The reaching lunge is the most powerful level change exercise that you have. That's why we're always doing reaching lunges here. But I want to talk about two types of reaching lunges, when you use one, when you use the other. Very important, because there's a lot of discussion on whether you straighten the back or you don't straighten the back, and we're gonna settle it right once and for all, okay? The reaching lunge is important, why? The reaching lunge is like this. Big step, here's the cue. Big step, write it down. Big step, well, remember it, you don't have to write it down, it's three things for crying aloud. Big step, little, little knee bend, and reach the toes. Big step, little knee bend, reach the toes. Both feet facing forward. Got it? Big step, little knee bend, reach for the toes. Little knee bend is the cue. Little knee bend is the cue. Why little knee bend? Because what are we gunning? What are we gunning? We're doing anti-sitting training, aren't we? We're gunning for what? For the three amigos. What are the three amigos? Hamstrings, glutes, paraspinals. Got it? Hamstring, glutes, paraspinal. That's your engine, that's your thruster, that's what gets you up, that's what fights gravity, that's what makes you jump, that's what makes you run. And it's all facilitated with a tight core. But I'm telling you right now, it's hamstring, glutes, paraspinal. You get that strong in, in, in people and you're gonna get rid of 90% of the problems that you have. I don't care if they're wrist problems. I don't care if they're shoulder problems. Right? You lengthen the front, strengthen the back. Lengthen the front, strengthen the back. Strengthen everything. And remember, you can't strengthen just like this, or just like this, it requires lengthening and shortening. So whatever you do to a short muscle, you do to a long muscle. There's no difference. If this muscle's short, I gotta lengthen it. Well then what, I ha what do I have to do? I gotta shorten it again. That makes it strong. This makes it strong. This makes a short muscle long. This makes a long muscle strong and short. It's, so it's a rep. See how simple it gets? Okay, so reaching lunges. Big step, little knee bend, reach towards the toes. Senior population, reach to the knees. Fitness people that are starting off, shin. Athletes with good flexibility, toes. The longer the step, the more flexible they, they, they have to be. Yes, the more the speed, the more the load. Got it? All right, now. Three planes of motion, sagittal, frontal, transverse. I want everybody giving me two on each side. So we're going forward. We're going lateral, both feet facing, and then we're going to the rear right and rear left corners. Bam, keep the knee going this way and go and reach. I want everybody two to the front, two to the side, two to the back. Let's go. Alternate your feet. That's all right, just, if you want, you can even get here. There you go. Carlito, if, can you pull that bench out of there? Mira, lo pones right in between, put it right in between the, uh, the, the, the rack, please. Okay? Yes, 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 yes. Now, the rotational one, all you're looking for the rotational one is here. Okay? Try to keep this foot forward. For beginners, lock the knee so they have to steal it from the ankle and the hip. Open up this hip and look, there you go. You see? It's here, here, there. Okay? Now, then you come back and you go to the other side. Alternating or you can go same side for 10 and then same side for 10. All right? Everybody's got that? What we're trying not to let them do is do this, especially at the beginning. 
athletes that know what they're doing, you can, you can give them a little bit more freedom. But people at the beginning, lock their knees. Because I'd rather steal it from the ankle than the knee. You steal it from the ankle, not much happens. You steal it from the knee, an ACL ruptures. Not a good thing. Okay? So protect the beginners. If in doubt, don't take them to the corners. Take them to the side and step them. The difference between the lateral and the rotational is the, is the changing of the foot. It's the rotation of the foot. That rotates the hips. You got it? So if they're not good back here, well, bring them here. Big step, little knee bend, reach for the toes. Cool? All right, now, so we got the stepping. We got the three planes of motion. To flex or not to flex is the next issue on the level changes. If in doubt, don't flex them. Bend at the hips. Boom. It looks like this. That's it. I can't go. Look, anything more? Watch where it comes from. Okay? If they have a past herniation of the disc, any lumbar issues, any kind of radiating pain, at the hips, at the hips. If in doubt, at the hips. As they get better, then you can allow that spine to flex nice. Do you want this here, you know? No. I want that spine. I don't mind if the spine bends during more advanced applications, but it's got to bend like this. It's got to look natural. It's got to look in here. See, I got a nice little, it's a little arc like this. It's not a big bend in any one place. You got it? So my flexion and extension from the standing position and my level change, my favorite stuff is the reaching lunge progression. If in doubt, keep their back straight, hinge primarily at the hips. As they get better, you can allow mild spinal flexion. The spine does very good in flex position, but not at high speeds. I can do it fast, but my speed is gonna be dominated at the hips. And my spine is just gonna go like this. Just give me a little flexion. And it's gonna hold that position. It's not, my spine doesn't do this really fast, really well. It's not made for that. It's got little, it's got little muscles in between each vertebrae and it's got long muscles. It's not like the quads or the glutes that you can see. It's this thick thing and it's got this much to go and that's capable of a lot of power. But the longitudinal stuff of the spine is made to hold, then everything holds, and then you can finish a deadlift, a thousand pound deadlift with nothing but spinal extension. But it's at very, very low speeds. Are we clear? So if in doubt, what happens in the reaching lunges? Hinge at the hips. You're always hinging at the hips. Flat back. Straight back. You got it? Eventually, teach them how to flex. Because when you tie your shoes, you flex. When you pick up the UPS box, you flex. When you put your kid inside the crib, you flex. When you're doing uh, yard work, you flex. So let's teach them how to flex safely. But we teach them through a neutral spine if in doubt. We got it? All right, now let's talk, let's talk about the push and the pull. Okay, push and pull. My favorite push to see a lot of stuff is the push-up. Okay, now I'm gonna show you a variety of push-ups that I know that you already went through, right? Did you guys go through the cross push-up, the T, the T with the cross, elbow to knee. Please tell me you did. I know Griff showed you. The T. And then did you go to the T here? Get out. He didn't show you? Well, we're going to have to give you a push-up workshop for five minutes. All right. So I can show off. I can't do anything. My hip won't allow me to. But I'm going to give you my, the best that I can. I won't, look at, I won't look my best. But we're going to show you just so you can see the variety. Talk about a push-up. Man, the push-ups are phenomenal. My favorite standing is what? You guys know what it is. What is my favorite push from the standing position? Standing band press. Standing band press, folks. Jesus, right in here. Why? Anti-sitting, where's the band pushing me? This way. If I go like this, guys, what am I doing? I'm walking. I'm extending the, the, the spine from the bottom up with every gait cycle. 
This I'm extending already down, but now the band's pushing me this way. So my core has to decelerate spinal extension because the band is pulling my shoulders back. All right, my core has to decelerate spinal extensions because in the stride, boom, my hips are going forward. Either way, I gotta decelerate spinal extension with the hip flexors and a tight core. So from a standing environment, this is an excellent locomotive exercise, the standing band press, all right? Again, simultaneous, alternating, unilateral, ipsy, and contra. Got it? But now let's go back to the push-up. I'm gonna show you how the push-up is not only a sagittal fr plane, frontal plane, but a killer rotational, and we're gonna try three or four different variations. You guys ready for this? All right. Everybody give me three push-ups just for a warm-up. Three push-ups and then give me a couple of T's. T push-ups, go push-up and go to the side. All right, cool. Everybody's doing a very nice job with the T's. When you go sideways, get your feet flat when they go sideways. Flat on their side. There you go. Make sure you get AD ductors and AB ductors. If you leave your feet there, you're, you're getting rotation somewhere through the body. But if you rotate the body as a totem pole, the whole, and you know what most of you are doing? You're leading with your hips. When you rotate, I don't want to see your butt rotate first. You rotate as a unit, zoom. If the shoulders rotate, I want to see the hips rotate. If the shoulders don't rotate, I don't want to, I don't want to see the hips rotate. This is what a lot, most, this is the most common mistake. Boom, watch. There it is. And this is what I'm looking for. Look. One unit. Now, from in here, okay, Give me a couple, it gets better. Griff didn't, show, Griff didn't give you all the gravy. No, that, that one was gonna be Cliffs? Cliffs, all right. So now you've got a cross crunch with a, with a push-up. So you have the front plank of the push-up, you have the lateral plank of the T, and you have cross wire core activation from that elbow to knee. Now you guys ready? It gets better. Gets better. Now you have, imagine a V up. Now could we throw a V up in there? You know what a V up is? A pike? That would be cool, right? Go, show me. There you go, and try to reach for the foot above the headline. Bring it up. Kick it up, baby. There you go, that's my man. Okay? That's just a little thing. You know, we've got about 37 different push-ups that we do. About 37 different push-ups. But that's just, if you want to see a lot of the push-ups, they're in the uh, essence of body weight training. Well, not, they're not even in there, because we developed about 20 after that DVD. All right? So there's my pushing from the bottom position. From my standing, yes? Push up to a V, you can call it whatever, yeah. Push up to a V, my, my guys know what that is. But you can call it a push up, yeah, a push up kick, a push up uh, toe to hand, reach, whatever you want to call it, give it your own name. I'm terrible with names, you know. I, there's other people more creative and they give it a good name, like blur peas and stuff like that. I'm like, rotational push up to a V. <laughs> All right? Okay, now, on the standing press, boom, boom, boom. Foot down, heel down, or heel up? Here you go. Here's the question bang and bang. Training the pillars, we're training a push. Heel down or heel up? You guys know me, you should not answer anything definitive. You know, you know that I've already said there's no wrong exercise, there's no yes or no, there's only reasons why. So don't fall for that when I tell you 
Just say, well, depends. Why? Look, if I want more hip opening, ah, I go down. It has to rob it from the hip. If I got a straight leg and I put that heel down, notice what happens at the hip. Get in a staggered stance, ball of the foot. Both feet facing forward. Okay, now keep the hip solid. Lock out that rear leg, the real, rear knee, yes? And now, don't move, just break, go back, 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 and put that rear foot flat. And look at what happens to that rectus femoris iliopsoas. Boom, right there in the front. You feel a stretch in the gastroc. Okay, so if you have people that squat and you see the heels come up, this is a great opportunity to pull, bring them in here and see if they're short in the calf. And you'll see that they're normally not short in the calf. So this is a calf stretch, basically, with a band push. So you're getting eccentric loading at the calf. All right, you're making the calf longer if that's what you want. All right, you're getting maximum, maximum stretch in the hip flexors and you're getting the stiff core. Now, if you go alternating, that's the, that, that's even, that even makes the locomotive thing even more effective, because look at the shirt wrinkling. If you want to really, really get this, you contralaterally load it. Boom, here you go. And watch the shirt wrinkle, see? This is your strong suit. This is not so strong, but gives you maximum horizontal orientation of the serape, anterior serape. Got it? I need you to go to any, any cable, any band, grab one, and go contralateral, go contralateral, punching, foot down, foot up. Contralateral punching, contralateral punching, rear heel up, rear heel down. Your back is the base leg in that? Your back will be the base leg, yeah. Because you're getting pushed backwards. You're getting pushed into that leg. Normally here, that's my base leg, but when the load comes this way, the rear leg becomes your base. Now, grab one arm only, one arm only, and tell me which, which one you feel stretching the core more. Opposite hand or the same side hand? But you can't be grabbing two hands, two, two, two bands. There you go, because that two, the two-handed version balances you. Only load one side. Only load one side. Load one side. All right, now tell me which one you feel. Contralateral, yes? All right, the opposite. And they asked me, what is the base leg on this exercise? Forward pressing, which is your base leg? Back leg, because normally, hold on, if he doesn't have this band here, yeah, go over here. If he doesn't have this band here, his front leg is loading him, okay? But as soon as I push him now back, right. that rear leg becomes the base leg. And the harder he loads it, it gets to the point where the load is so high, it actually lifts the front leg up. And you guys know, you guys know that it takes about 40 to 45 percent of his body weight to lift this front leg up from a standing pressing position. You know that, right? The, the, the study that Stu McGill and, uh, and we did on the standing press, let it go, let it go. If he's here, he, get, get good position, get a good position, all right? Hold, watch. Just be, be a rock. I won't push you, just be a rock. Let me lift your front leg. There it is, look at this. As a matter of fact, fingers, go. Lift it up, he's there. How much do you weigh, roughly? 180. 180 figure, 190. How much can I push just like this? Push into me. Lift your foot and push, 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 push. He's got his foot up. How much can I possibly apply with these fingers? He's not even, 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 he's not even pushing my fingers back. 80 pounds is what it takes for me to take a, 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 a human being at the shoulder, about 42% of their body weight gets them going in the other direction. Which now begs the question, why are you bench pressing? And the answer would be? Depends. Huh? Depends. It depends on what? Huh? 
It depends on what you want. If you want to get big, the band press is not the right choice because you can only use 42% of your body weight. And most people can press that rather easy. You know, how's this guy going to get uh, strong bench pressing 40% of 190? You know, what, what is that? Uh, you know, 60 pounds? Can you imagine you trying to get big with 60 pound bench press? You know? So if I want to put upper body size on him, I lay him down and then we go 200 pounds for 8, 10, whatever. Okay? But from a standing environment, this is what counts right here. And the stiffer, and that is, folks, 42% is assuming. It's a static model, assuming that no joints in the body move. Isn't that cool? Now, what do you think the chances of finding a human body where we can't find stability in one joint? That's why I didn't have to apply 80 pounds to him. If he was a bronze statue, then I would have to apply 80 pounds. But since he's looking for stability and there's a bunch of joints, we got 24 joints in the lumbar spine that, where he could go. We got the hip, we have the knee, we have the ankles, we have the shoulders, we got everything. So if he goes anywhere in a couple of little joints, now it takes me 60 pounds because he's all over the place. You see? So that's the importance of standing pushing. That's the importance of creating a stiff core. That's why the push-up is a great exercise. Okay? Cool. Now the pulling. Right? If the core front decelerates spinal extension, then the back decelerates flexion, okay? So it's my flexor chain that ex decelerates extension, and this is my extensor chain that decelerates flexion, all right? The back, the three amigos, hamstring, glutes, paraspinals, decelerate you when you go down to tie your shoe so your face doesn't hit the ground, all right? It loads a jump so you can go up. It changes direction so you can go this way, the extensor, all right? And the pulling just brings you things closer. Okay, I want you to try two of our favorite pullings. The standard uh, simultaneous parallels, we're, we're already doing. I want to combine. I want to combine. So compound rowing is one of the favorite things that you need to learn. Compound rowing here and compound rowing from a staggered stance. Why? What exercise prepares me for staggered stance compound rowing that we just did? There were two progressions. What is it? The reaching lunge, and before we did the reaching lunge, the anterior reach. So we got two progressions there, all right? Now, this is why I say depends. This anterior reach is a lot more difficult than this reaching lunge. This anterior reach is a lot easier than this reaching lunge. That's why I say there's no black and white because there's a spectrum. So, you, for, for example, my mom, I wouldn't start her with the anterior reach because I got to get her to balance on a single leg. I would start her with the reaching lunge because anybody can do this. You see what I'm saying? Okay? So I kind of like that reaching lunge before the anterior reach because it's a lot easier to get people stepping than it, than it is to get them single leg balancing and going. However, knowing that we progress from two feet to staggered positions to single leg, wouldn't this be part of the anterior reach progression? Because I would take my mom, if she can't do this, she would do this reach, which now I'm setting her up for compound rowing, right? While I'm teaching her this, I'm teaching her this one. All I got to do is get her to combine this reach with this row, and we get the compound row. After mom does this, I get mom to do this. Meanwhile, she's doing this, this, one arm. It's, it's real fast. Bang, 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 bang. Now I'm loading that front leg. Now she's able to get in here and go single leg. You get that progression? Okay, so I want a couple of parallel compound rows, just two or three, staggered stance, two on one side, staggered stance, Two on the other side, so you can see the difference in paraspinal, glute, and hamstring activation on this favorite pull that we have. All right, let's go. Thank you. Where's the grip? Where's the grip? 
You like? Okay, now, on the bent over, on the bent over, because I see these people do it all the time, I see trainers do a squat and a row. And my question is, why the hell are you doing a squat and a row? We never squat and row, or we never row and squat. I see them doing this, I see them doing this. No, remember what the cue is on the reaching lunge? Big step, little knee bend, reach for the toes, the compound row, little knee bend. Little knee bend, get everything from the hips. This is where you make the hips strong. I don't want any slack on the band. Get, back, get far out enough so when you reach, there's no slack on the band. Adam, don't let them squat and row. It's a reach and row, little knee bend. Good job, man, that looks good. And of course, you can single arm, single leg load this and do a resisted anterior reach. All right, so now let's try one leg, contralateral grip, reach, come back and row. Let the other one go, that's the easy part. You got now, now go. <laughs> So we got single leg, contralateral grip, reach, and row. The other way, sweetie. The other foot. There you go. That's ipsilateral. Go contralateral with the black. There you go. Contralateral. Opposite leg. There you go. Base leg. The reference leg is always the base leg. Do you feel it in your glutes and hams? On the base leg. On your base leg. Yeah. That's where you're supposed to feel it. Now, look how hard that training is on the glute and hamstrings with little weight. But, it's, but your butt is getting a butt kicking with, with little bands. With little bands. Imagine if you're doing 10, 15 reps with a yellow or a green band. Man, that's, that's high level training for the hips. That's athletic stuff. What he's trying to do, look at him. I mean, he, he's barely able to control that, and, and we're working with bands. It's not like we're working with, that's even too heavy for him. Okay, so this is how you can load an anterior reach. You can load an anterior reach also with a dumbbell and stuff like that. The horizontal band gives you more horizontal component. Okay, super. So that's my favorite, that's my favorite pull, all right? It comes from the standing band progression, all right? And of course, you know that one of my favorite pulls is the recline rope. The recline rope offers me an environment where I can do a stability ball bridge and a cable roll all at the same time. So like the push-up is one of my favorite pushing exercises because it involves everything. The recline pull is also one of my favorite exercises, okay? Now, I need someone to help me. This is advanced, but you're an advanced kind of guy. Uh, just um, face that. You know what? Let's take this. Yeah, let's go in here. As a matter of fact, so they can see better. Uh, just uh, here, let's do this. Why don't we do this nice and easy? And that way we don't have to, we don't have to crush you on the advanced stuff. There you go. Do that. Yeah, yeah, perfect. There you go, let's put, the, let's put the bar there. Now, I want you to get under, your feet facing the class. Okay. Here's how we can mess around with that recline pull. Remember, you can use the jungle gym too, the, the jungle gym that I designed, a heavier duty one, or a rope, or a bar. Now, let's pull the bar back here this way. Get your feet, lay down. Or just sit, yeah, just sit down, sit down. And now we're gonna do a recline pull. Okay, now, feet together, good. Easy, right? And of course you can be this high for seniors and lower, lower, lower for athletes. Now, if I really wanna bang that single leg rotational torque, I ask them to lift a leg, lift a leg, and lock out this base knee now. Perfect, go. There you go. 
Now he's got a little bit of a torque issue here that he has to stabilize. Now I want to increase the torque, open the leg that way. Now go. I've just taken the core and gone like this, boom. Great job. So that's two of the tweaks that you can go. Lift the leg, so we're taking, we're taking, it's all right. We're taking the table, taking away a, a, a leg, and telling the table, use whatever muscles you've got to keep that table from rotating. The muscles that you've got are your rotational muscles. That's what we call training the invisible. We can train rotation without rotating the body. We can flex, train the flexors without flexing the body. Give me an example of an exercise that we already went through, training my flexors without flexing the body, training the invisible. I want to train my abdominals. Push-up is one, posterior reach, I'm extending. What was the other one? Band press. Band press. Band press and push-ups would be two examples of training the abdominals, all right, without doing flexion. You got it? Okay. So we've got, now we're finishing off now with rotation and we're done with the four pillars workshop. Okay? Rotations. What type of two rotations do I use? Come on. What is it? Right, show me the mobility that I use. Okay, that's on the pulling, on the rotation I'm talking about. There you go, there you go. So I use two types of rotations. One with pivots, one with no pivots. You gotta know this. Why would I use the pivot rotation? No, 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 I, yes, more range of motion. Give me the part of the body, the hips. If I want to internally rotate the hip, which I want to do all the time because when people sit, they sit with their legs open. They sit on their butt, so their butt's going to be weak, and they sit with their legs open, and the guys especially, we sit like this, so all the guys are externally rotated this way. They, we hate internal rotation. Women have a Q angle, so they're, and, and they're more this way, all right? So they kind of have better internal rotation than men. So all my guys, especially the guys, I need pivots. Pivot, 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 so I can drive the hips into internal rotation. All right? No internal rotation trains what? Now, if I'm, yeah, you go. Everybody here, 10 o'clock, 2 o'clock rotations real quick. Don't let them shake the butt. That's the whole thing. Keep the butt, keep everything stiff, and move the shoulders as fast as possible. Go, 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 go. Use your legs. You feel it in the core? Okay. No pivot core stiffness. Pivot, hips. Simple. If we're training with no pivot, we're really going after high levels of core stability. Let me show you. Grab the green predator, face the class. Just one, just one. There you go. Grab that. that. Okay, face them. Come to me. Come to me here. All right. Is it pretty hard now? All right, lock, lock this thing over. Lock this thing right in front of you, right there. Now watch. Turn to me, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Turn to me here and pivot that right foot. Come on, right to here, come on. See how, okay, now, turn to me and don't pivot. No problems. He can activate a lot more core when he's stable. Remember about the unstable training? If I put this guy on a Dyna disc or on a rocker board or on a Reebok step or on a Bosu ball, he can't do this. He can't do this. But as soon as I give him this pyramid and say, get to the ground, get this as tight as you can go, and now go to me, he can do it. Go. Bam. What kind of training do you want? I'll pivot with lighter loads to get this to internally rotate. But I will not pivot under high loads to get this to go really stiff on me. Go. Okay? Yeah. All right, now, watch this. Uh, that big dyno disc. All right, now, I want to see, step on that, and, have, and you can see that I already moved it. Do something. Whatever you can with that band. You can't do nothing. All right, do it. Come over here. Feel his stomach. Watch it. He can't even make it stiff because, feel his stomach. Yeah. It, I mean, he, he's, he's a tight guy, but... 
Right? Yeah. Now watch. Okay, step off. Now come out here. I can put more load. Now feel what he does. All right, move it all the way over, baby. Yeah, totally. See the difference? Yeah. This thing here has to get like a rock. Done. Done. If I balance on my knees, on that ball, if you touch my stomach, it's got tone, but not hard. I pull that band out to here. You can't fake that. So there's a difference between training for balance and training for stability and core stiffness. You can't put somebody on an unstable surface and generate the kind of forces you need to generate to train high level core stiffness. So what I want you to do right now is grab a band, grab a cable, and I want you to give play around with different lengths. Rotation versus no rotation. Okay. You got two minutes to complete it. At 2.30. You're, you're rolling at 2.30. All right, just give me some pivot rotations and then get a lot more load on that band from, from distance and then get me some short ones and see which one do you want for core training. You see the difference? Give me some pivots and no pivots. Big difference, huh? You can barely breathe. If you get it so tight where you can barely breathe, that's where you want it. All right. Okay, we got to finish it up. We got to wrap it up. All right, folks. Sure. Okay, when you're pivoting, you're pivoting at the hip. The SI joint lumbar area stays tight. You're pivoting at the hip. You're pivoting here. You're not pivoting here. When you're in here, you're still pivoting at the hip, but you have full ground control. Look, I'm still pivoting, and I'm getting a little bit of spinal rotation where it's appropriate. Less at the lumbar spine, more as you go higher. Okay? All right, so now you've got the four pillars. Our favorite ways of training the four pillars the functional way of training the four pillars, so now you can do a good job at training your people functionally. Yes? All right, good enough. Awesome. Whoo! As you can see, that was a thumping four hours. I gotta tell you, we have a blast when we have the elite in the fitness industry come and honor us with their presence here at the Institute of Human Performance. We built this place so we could raise the industry to the next level and educate and share all of our experiences. This is a special place, special things go on right in here. These individuals obviously were into it, they loved it, we love presenting, and it's always a blast to have the elite in fitness industry visit us here in sunny South Florida at the Institute of Human Performance. Hope you enjoyed that presentation and come and visit us if you're here in sunny South Florida. It's beautiful, baby. Come bring it.